All right, hello again to anyone watching these Kaijudo videos. Today I am bringing the recap for the third Kaijudo Open that I hosted through the Rangers Dojo Discord group. So uh, this time around, I didn't have as much coverage as the last um, the last few. I mean, in the past, I <laughs> did a crap ton of matches, also did a few intro discussion and a breakdown discussion after the fact. This time around, I did record a couple videos, but I ended up having trouble with the <laughs> With the recordings, unfortunately, I had a match um, that I covered as well as the intro discussion that I did with TKC. But like I said, unfortunately, my recordings got kind of lost and had some issues with them. So I decided um, this time around, I'd just do a, a recap of what happened. So I have the seven deck lists from the players that played this time around. And uh, I figured I'd go over them, uh, hopefully a little more briefly this time around. And then I'd uh, show the final results and tell a little bit about how things played out. But uh, yeah, I guess I can jump right into the uh, the start of things. So Dark Signer uh, playing once again. And I think for the the third time at this point, he's brought Lightwater Enforcers. All of his lists have been pretty similar. Um, he's played Magris in the past. I think he's played Skyvolt Mech in the past. He's had a different number of evolutions. I think he's messed around with one Sasha. His first list, I think, had two Blinder Beetle Prime, but went to three this time and uh yeah i mean with the full nine shield blast um pretty pretty standard to what he's played so far and he's always done pretty well with it so return to i guess a good old faithful for for him so uh i know after the tournament he mentioned a couple changes he'd like to make um for example i think he decided to cut the the master trader cephalias which i mean personally i'm not totally on board with i think it's still kind of maybe not crucial but still in a, a nice piece of the the kind of anti-control anti-midrange kind of spectrum of the the matchups but uh, the cards he would opt to play instead were the third rusalka and the third keeper of laws which are both cards i'm totally happy to play i think that it makes sense to me that i would definitely probably prefer the third keeper before cephalia but i still think cephalia has a place but i mean from his perspective he felt like most of the the matchups against control, maybe Cephalia wasn't needed because you already have Finbar, and then Keeper of Laws is just better, as I kind of just mentioned. And then, I mean, Rusalka is just a great tempo card for a lot of matchups. Um, so again, I'm totally on board. I think maybe you could consider keeping a Cephalia over one of the Shield Blasts. Maybe you consider it over the Sasha, for example. I'm not super sold on Sha Sasha. Like, it's good against control but it's kind of situational at times as well just because it gets blocked pretty easily and a lot of the control decks have a bunch of blockers lying around so if they're able to do that then there's kind of ways around it often it's kind of situational in terms of actually breaking through against a lot of control decks i find but obviously still a pretty powerful threat um but it's and it's particularly strong against other aggro decks and dragons i think dragons that point has a lot of merit although i think this deck does a pretty good job getting under other aggro decks so i'm not super sold on needing it for those matchups so i don't know i think those are some i'm definitely on board with dark Siren's idea to add the third keeper of laws i'm definitely on board with a third aqua chaser as well but uh i still think sophelia has a place but I, I i can totally be on board with it being kind of on the it's sort of in the rotation in terms of the last few slots, whether how you tune the deck. And I, I don't think it's maybe a staple, but uh, yeah, regardless, a pretty solid deck from Dark Signer and uh, perform well. Obviously, I'll go over how everything played out for these lists after the fact. Um, Karik brought Lightwater Dark Nature Control. So kind of an interesting list, pretty different from a lot of the, I guess, more standard pile lists. I think one that's easy to look to is the the list that David Di Lorenzo piloted to second place at the Open Open way back in, <laughs> I guess all the way back in 2014. Um, so that list, I mean, was a little bit more spell based, and there's a bunch of omissions in Kerrick's build here. Things like uh, Mesmerize being a big one, Skull Shatter, Reverberate, uh, Mana Storm, those kinds of cards. A lot of those spells are sort of missing from this list. And this one has gone more creature based with Tar Gushers, Joe, or Johnny Darkseed, and then has a lot more 
shield blasts, like more impactful shield blasts, like Sumo Artichoke, Triple Storm Spark Blast, five of these pit effects, three pits and two root traps, which, I mean, it's just a great shield blast, double tendril grasp. So lots of high impact stuff, no piercings, no aqua striders, which I find pretty interesting as well. I guess keeping the multi sieve count pretty low and then also keeping a very small water section with it, which I think does look a little bit odd to me. Um, with especially like Coral, for example, like you look at the mana base to support Coral and it's not really there. Um, it's not really adequate for casting turn three Coral, which I think is a little bit suspect. But I think the way to think about Coral for this deck, I guess, would be to use it later in the mid game. Like maybe you have eight ma on your eight mana turn, you want to make sure you can survive to play Andromeda, so you drop Coral. Or you use Coral to set a Storm Spark or Sumo Artichoke to make sure you can untap and land Andromeda the next turn. I guess that's kind of more of its purpose in this list. Um, but I think when I look at the water section, the main card you're trying to use is Crystal Memory. I think that's the best water card. Um, I'll pro I'd probably just straight up the best water Shield Blast. Maybe Bottle is probably better. I, get I guess you could make that argument. Um, different kind of card, but... Bottle is probably another omission here from this deck that I, I kind of question, especially when you have such a small water section to the point where you're basically just splashing Crystal Memory, in my mind, because um, like I said, it's the most important water card. Um, if you're going to be doing that, I, I don't see why what my Bottle of Wishes wouldn't be one of the the cards you'd include to, su to support Crystal Memory. Uh, but, but nevertheless, I think it kind of... Yeah, I like water memory being so good i guess i kind of think of this as like a light dark nature deck that just you splashing memory is a great shield blast slash also a good card to cast in the mid to late game once you've kind of stabilized to find or even to f make a bunch of mana and then find an andromeda to stabilize or absolute darkness um or just like find the haven to take over the game once you have stabilized um but yeah overall just really strong shield blast just because like when you're when you're getting hit all you need is to find that andromeda or even the absolute darkness and it just does a great job of doing that and i guess you want enough other water cards that you can actually hard cast it so but like i said i don't know if i would exactly pick these water cards to support it if you are going that direction um like i like i mentioned i would kind of like to have a bottle of wishes maybe even a tritonis just to give you a little more late game power or, or even just like a one of reverberate um even if you can't consistently cast memory in the early to mid game to find a reverberate that would obviously be a little bit demanding of the again the mana base to support wa for the water cards but i don't know overall it's like a it's an interesting approach that's kind of shaped the way i've thought about pile decks to some extent um, just because, I mean, I would, had already become a little bit disillusioned with the sort of DiLorenzo list. I felt like it was just a little bit too weak, just pretty soft to the kind of typical anti-control cards, pretty soft to just any kind of Lightwater X tempo deck, even soft to Lightwater um, Dragon, like our Lightwater X kind of, or the, not Lightwater, the Lightwater Fire kind of tempo Dragon style of deck. I think it was a little bit too soft to those even. So... Yeah, I had just been kind of falling, those, that list had been kind of falling out of favor with me for a while. And I think this is an interesting approach to maybe just like the more impactful shield blast and move towards more creature based, the move towards absolute darkness as like a nine mana defensive play. It does a little bit better of a job at, uh, I think, counteracting the aggro decks to some extent, in, in some areas <laughs> at least. But. It is definitely a lot softer to other controls and mid-range, even like certain kinds of mid-range decks, even in my eyes, can capitalize on this deck. Just having no mesmerize, having no no um, no tools. Like that I guess that's kind of the problem is when I like the the D Lorenzo list, for example, it's got more varied varied stuff in it. It's got the card advantage with Mana Storm and, and Reap and So. And reverberate it's got the discard interaction like mesmerize and skull shatter which are mi all missing from this deck um but i don't know maybe it's one of those things where you try to do too much of everything and then you just kind of fail in a bunch of directions and you mostly just end up being good against kind of other control decks 
Whereas this list seems like it's mostly just good against aggro deck. I'm not really sure exactly where to where to line things up, but I think this kind of approach has a little more merit. Stuff like Sumo Auto Choke. Just the aggro decks are strong. You need to respect them a little bit more, I guess. Um, Absolute Darkness is particularly impressive too in these metagames in particular. Like it's great against um, Dark Signer's kind of low power light water deck, um, for example. Other things like that. Like a lot of the and and it just complements Andromeda so well, just because they kind of punish the opposite sort of stuff. So in order to play around Andromeda, you almost need to build a huge board, right? A lot of decks, like the tempo decks especially, they'll drop their small creatures. They'll build out a huge board. They'll drop their Finbar. Maybe even. Well, not even maybe, just often juggling Andromedas to just kind of tempo them out, preventing them from getting multiple giant creatures on board. And as you do that, you could just keep drawing cards with fin bars, and you keep spitting out piles of creatures every turn. And you just try to go wide and push through those Andromedas. And I feel like that's a play pattern that comes up reasonably often. Um, but, or, but Absolute Darkness just pretty hard counter counters that strategy. And it puts your opponent in really tough spots because it's also just really hard to play around Absolute Darkness because if you try to hold back all your creatures to not play into this sweeper effect, you're just going to get d obliterated by the Andromeda, right? You're just going to get obliterated by even Haven because Haven's another card. Like, it, it does a good job stabilizing as a giant hexproof blocker that makes your other blockers huge. But if all you have is a couple blockers, like, it's not a big deal. Like, your opponent can attack through that for the win. But when you have like artichokes and storm sparks to back that up, and on top of that you also have absolute darkness, um, it makes it really hard to do that. And like if you, but even still, like you can still play through the haven. But uh, if you, but you kind of have to go wide to do that, right? And then if they have the darkness, then you just kind of lose if you go wide, right? And that's like that's like the kind of duality because if you go. If you only play two creatures, you're gonna lose to the Haven no matter what, right? So, or if you only you're gonna make Andromeda way too easy to stabilize with. So you need to go wide to get through those giant bomb creatures, and then Darkness punishes that. Like, so Darkness has been pretty particularly impressive. Now, I guess like the thing is, you could just play like Cassiopeia, Squilla Scourge. Although Squilla Scourge is a little bit of a different kind of card, Squillis would definitely help the mana base too. Just adding another water card, which is another inclusion that I would definitely think about and that is maybe kind of a weird omission but there's only so many cards you can play in these decks and absolute darkness being nine mana is pretty pretty relevant I would say but Cassiopeia is much more geared to um, definitely fighting the haven mirrors but of note it was also kind of interesting like the original deck K-Rick submitted was this like 60 card list that was similar to this that I actually found kind of interesting and it didn't have haven it was just like three andromeda and like the absolute darknesses and then just a bunch of early game support a little more ramp stuff with like bronze arm tribes even um like a, a way more powerful ramp package and then just a bunch even more shield blasts it was kind of interesting actually like as like a giant anti-aggro deck that you would just like have these andromedas and darknesses in your deck that you would eventually find but like you wouldn't see them early because you have this 60 card pile and then it was just like all interact cheap interaction or cheap cheap cards shield blasts and like ramp spells and then because like haven is not even that good against the aggro decks like it's the 10 mana bomb that you mostly play for the control mirrors but like just capping out all you need is andromeda and a bunch of other creatures to to be an aggro and absolute darkness as well so that was kind of an interesting approach too but at the same time, it's also just a deck that would get obliterated by other control decks when you don't have Haven. So I guess that's the kind of balancing factor is like if you're a control deck, you kind of need to make your deck worse against aggro if you want to have any chance against other control decks. But uh, yeah, overall, interesting build made me think a little bit more about how to build these kinds of decks in the future. Although I think there are some odd things that could be maybe changed or updated with this kind of list, but definitely interesting. The next list is Gareth's Lightwater Nature Megabugs. So I know Gareth was a big fan of Hive Queen, I think one of his favorite cards. He also loves Anjak and Broodmother, so um, was definitely down to, or was super interested in playing Megabugs for this event. And uh, I helped him kind of go over the list to decide what to play and ended up with this kind of 
trying out the three full f- the flutter bugs from R- uh, Eye of the Storm, trying out, I mean, a, a suite of one ofs as well, just one of Cephalia, which ended up being pretty good. I think the PPR, you could argue for more even. There's um, Homunculon, pretty good card. Could maybe argue for more. And then just like the <laughs> random one of uh, extra two drops. So pretty clean list, I think, overall. So it performed decently well for him and and Jack I think pairs well with like the the whole mega bug package gives you a, a strong threat against dragons and some other mid-rangey decks as well it's hard to interact with generates a bunch of inter- inter- uh, advantage um I think it's hard to support like blinder beetle prime and hive queen in the same deck I think Lyra is also a bit expensive like you don't want too many six drops so yeah just keeping it at like Finbar, Hive Queen, and then and Jack is just kind of a, another mid-rangey aggro threat. So just solid deck overall. Um, maybe not the perfect build. I think there's different ways to approach it for sure. You, maybe you don't even need to play Scamps, but yeah, pretty solid deck. Next up, we have Andros playing Monofire Rush. So this list pretty similar to the one that I profiled way back as one of the early videos I posted on the channel. Um... I actually checked that list just to see how close it was and when I looked I saw that I was playing three Ashen Tributes which looking back is just completely ridiculous to me. Um, Monofire in particular handles blockers really well already with three Torhelm, three Restless and I think playing three Ashen Tributes is kind of insane. Um, really like that Andros cut one. I would like to see him cut probably even more to be honest. I think going down to one, probably even zero Ashen Tributes would probably be better. Um, I like that he went with Blade Spawn, uh, the, from Eye of the Storm, 2 mana, 2k, you can clash. If you win, you give it fast attack, which I think is pretty powerful. Obviously, a criticism I hear a lot is that you're just not going to win the clash, so why play it? But my thinking is, like, 2 mana, 2k was already quite a strong 2-drop. I thought it was the best, um, fire 2-drop after, uh, Lava Leaper, and... Yeah, I, so I was already playing like Bron- Bron- Bronca regardless or whatever other 2 mana 2k vanilla you could think of. And this card is just a pretty strong upgrade to that. Like even if it only wins 5 to 10% of the time in terms of clashes, like that's all I really need. Like 2 mana 2k that can sometimes get fast attack on turn 2 is just kind of insane in my opinion. So yeah, it doesn't need to win that many clashes for it to be good. So because you want uh, you want more two drops anyways and i like that some of the other changes i think um, my original list had like jet flames but that was kind of just because i was had the one drops with the list showing what you could play and obviously if you're not playing dracon evolutions it makes sense to just stick to sledge bot the protector is definitely relevant when you have these evolution creatures that you've, you've invested a few cards into so i mean even just protecting some of your 1ks like a jet thrust starter from being attacked uh, by like other small creatures that could potentially eat it for free you can just kind of trade or even protect it from 1500 power creatures or things like that so protector definitely relevant protects blaze belcher too obviously so that's nice i think lava leaper would perform pretty well for andros that was something that stuck out to him and even dark signer commented on it at, at points is how nice lava leaper is and i think that's a big benefit to avoiding dracons uh this card is quite strong um, definitely the best two drop on turn two that you can play like it just does such a good job dodging shield blast creatures that could otherwise blow you out like namely arbiter i guess um keo can definitely handle this card obviously um sumo artichoke can't kill lava leaper which is nice insulation but sumo artichoke is a blowout in a lot of other ways so it's not i mean sumo artichoke in general is just very strong but even still not being able to be attacked is quite relevant even in those situations but yeah, I like Lava Leaper. Just does a good job counteracting a lot of stuff. Just gets in for its ability to just kind of... It does a good job getting you extra damage, right? And that's all you really care about is it, it can get a second attack in where other creatures often can't. So that's super relevant. Um, I guess there's argument to consider Shredmobile, which is another two drop from Eye of the Storm, uh, which is something I was thinking about too. It's kind of similar. To, it's very similar to Lava Leaper. It's a two mana 1k. And when it's attacked, it goes up to 3k. So has a pretty... Effectively, it's the same ability as Lava Leaper, except it can't be attacked by creatures that are less than 3,000 rather than 3,000 or less, essentially is what it amounts to. 
like a, a sumo artichoke wouldn't be able to attack lava leaper at all whereas a sumo artichoke can trade with a shred mobile for example but um i think the card is is pretty good and i guess the question is like how many lava leapers you really need so the way i kind of think about it is that lava leaper is like the best two drop on turn two but after turn two uh they kind of have diminishing returns right so after turn two every lava leaper you draw is kind of it's it's losing percentage points because it could be like a blade a blade spawn which i think is better on turn two or after turn two because the chance of fast attack is better because the ability is not going to do as good of a job translating to extra damage off of lava leaper as the abilities of like flame spinner or blade spawn do getting you extra damage um, once you're past turn two so there's kind of like this weird balancing act where you want like enough of these kind of lava leapers to have them consistently on turn two but then not so many that you don't have the cards that are better late game right because uh, there, there's sort of a balance there so you could make an argument to have like a mixed a number so for example like if i just cut these ashen tributes you could have like two treadmobile two blade spawn or something like that maybe is a nice balance but I'm not exactly sure what the right balance is. I think I would probably still lean to playing the full three blade spawn because there are a number of matchups where blade spawn is actually better than lava leaper. Um, matchups like control decks, for example, that aren't going to be playing like two drops like attack and kill lava leaper. Uh, in those matchups, you just pretty much play blade spawn every time on turn two just for the hope of winning the clash and getting in that extra attack. So. Because there's matchups like that, I think Blade Spawn is good enough to play the full three, and then I'd probably maybe consider if I want to play an extra two drop, I'd probably play the, the Shredmobile would be the next in line. I think Flame Spinner is like yeah, I think it's pretty key. I like this card a lot. It's just so good at pairing for with other cards for fast attack damage. I think it's too important, even though it's obviously the worst to cast turn two. Um, yeah, but overall, pretty solid list. Um, don't have too much negative to say about it at all. So the next list is Louis 5 Civ Fresh Av. So his build has a few changes that uh, port the deck to open. I guess mainly just the uh, Gigahorn Charger and Reef Prince, which are ways of just finding your combo pieces and getting your plus ones, I guess. So those are helpful cards for sure. Um, I think this list is 45 cards. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. This deck is tough to build, right? You have to balance the five civilizations. It, you often end up with a lot of multi-civs doing so. So it's kind of awkward. There's a lot of choices as well. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I'm not an expert on this deck by any means, so I'm not too sure. But I, I don't, I'm not super impressed by Snapdragon and Necros, for example. Not even, maybe not even Reef Prince. Like, if I'm looking for extra water mana, I would maybe consider just the third Boran, because it's water and nature mana, which is helpful. Um, I think Necros, I just don't think is that good. Like, obviously it has a bunch of synergy with this, with certain cards in this deck. But I've always thought Necros was a little bit of, like, an overkill type card. Um, like, it's multiple bodies, lets you kind of, it has, like, combo synergy for sure. But I don't think this is a card I'd want to waste a multi-civ slot in my deck on. Um, I think there's better things you could do uh, in, the, in that department. So, yeah, I think this choice is a little bit questionable. I think Sumo Artichoke is a card that's very, very strong. I know this deck already has a lot of other high-impact Shield Blast creatures, but still, I think Sumo Artichoke is just so good. Even if it is kind of like an uncastable type card, I think it's just pretty strong. But... Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. You have even like three, seeing like the third Psychic Predator Rusalka, for example. But yeah, I'm not really sure. It's weird balance. Like you have to balance a bunch of uh, a bunch of stuff. I'm not quite sure. I'd probably like to slim it down a bit too. But uh, yeah, the balance between Broodmother and Gigahorn Charger is also kind of interesting. Interesting. Like Gigahorn obviously lets you find specific cards like Serpents, which is super crucial in some matchups. Like obviously boron which is just crucial in general but uh the difference is like this deck even though like all these cards like reef prince gigahorn those are plus pluses right like they get you a creature in play and a card back in hand like that's a plus one but the problem is i think you're definitely concerned with straight up hand advantage like ignoring the creature entirely like you're just concerned with raw hand plus ones which is 
like a, maybe a subset of that overall equation because like you need to be able to hit your land drops to get up to eight mana and you also so like that's where broodmother comes in key right because just drawing two cards will make sure you can hit your land drops while still making plays whereas if all you do is like play giga horn charger search a, a boran now you have like the boran you want to hold and play towards but you're now you're you're just gonna end up in spots where you have to charge your top decks to get there. So like yeah, just the raw hand advantage that Broodmother offers is still just pretty important, which is why I think you need to balance those effects. But yeah, it, it's kinda interesting where what direction you go with that, but overall I think yeah, there's definitely some changes to make. I think the deck I mean it has like an inherent clunkiness to it, like five saves, a bunch of multi saves. A lot of awkward cards that are kind of expensive from hand, for ex for example. But and, and you're kind of limited. You're basically like limited to one play a turn a lot of the time, and you're just really banking on having the shield blast creatures to show up to kind of break that paradigm. And often they will. I mean, the deck has a lot. I think it's like yeah, 14 or something like that. 17? Yeah, 17 shield blast. Like it's a ridiculous number. So it definitely will have those, but. But yeah, there is some interesting stuff to think about with this deck list, but there are some cards I'd probably forego, but at the same time, there's a lot of cards in here that you can't really mix up with the numbers too much. I think maybe another card to consider is Johnny Darkseed as well, something that just does a great job generating advantage, similar to Broodmother, like just hits your land drops, like one Resolve Darkseed and you're good to go, right? So I do like that card, but it is a Dark Nature multi, so... And I don't know, yeah, maybe not the best idea, but definitely a card I appreciate. Next up, we have the list I played, which is Monolite Aggro. So this deck, um, it's a bit kind of targeted in what it attacks. Like it's definitely, especially with the list I have here, it's pretty strong against other aggro decks, but pretty weak to a lot of controls, especially darkness based decks that have like discard or not necessarily discard, but like. Bone Blades is really strong against this deck. Um, just Terra Pits in general are pretty strong, like that. those kinds of effects. Like it's much stronger against people who are using Tempo Tools, kind of like Dark Signer's List, like where they can't really out the evolutions entirely. Like just these Tempo Shield Blasts, like Piercing, Storm Spark, and Arbiter, that kind of just stop attacks or bounce creatures, tapping. Like bounce and tap isn't really a problem. It's like removal, like kind of K-Rick style where he's got terra pits and root traps and that kind of stuff slayers are definitely a big problem as well so like that kind of stuff is problematic which is why like it can be decent against certain kind of controls like super spell based controls because you have like three keeper laws because you have like a pretty just cheap curve in general um you can have good matchups against certain kind of controls but yeah like the m really mid-rangey darkness decks um those are going to be pretty, pretty big problems, like Underworld Stalker, Targusher paired with like blockers and and good shield blast. Like that's a recipe for disaster. But against a lot of aggro decks, like Rush is almost like that's a ridiculously good matchup for this. For example, like Mono Fire Rush. It it's and yeah, like even like decks like Garrus, Mega Bugs. Like a lot of the aggro decks is really good against, but a bit weaker to certain kind of controls. Especially, like I said, with the build where I have, like, the nine shield blasts. And, like, even three chasm is kind of questionable. But I think most of the cards I like, I think I profiled this deck in the past. And I think the difference was back then I was playing even more shield blasts. I had, like, the three 1500 power, three mana shield blast enforcer guy. Who was just kind of like a vanilla. But I cut that for, I think, two more Commissar Saurus. And the... Sparkblade Protector, and I, I I like that. I like having the the Sparkblade kind of just doubles down on the good matchups. I guess like it gives you that one more con the consistency on the four four drop double breaker evolution. Although I think it was a mistake to play Sparkblade after I submitted my deck. I kind of realized that um, with all the baits like Salvation Reckoner, um, Commissar, and then kind of to an extent Keeper of Laws like. I should have just played the vanilla Sunstorm Dreadnought instead. Like, the text on Sparkblade's not that relevant, and it's often even a downside to be a blocker. 
uh, like against Rush, where they can just Comet Missile it or Conflagration it or all sorts of stuff, right? So I think that can actually be a detriment. So I'm not a big fan of the of the card. I would probably, in hindsight, prefer I just had that extra just vanilla guy who can evolve on anything. I think that would have been more beneficial. Um, so yeah, there are other options as well. You can consider some of like the small evolutions, which I don't think are very good, but they were played historically, like Nova Cruiser or Rhodey Gale. You can consider different two drops, I guess. Um, there's like Regents Attendant, Att Attendant that might help against Slayers to protect your evolutions. Um, you could just give up on Chasm Entangler entirely, which I think is kind of reasonable. But yeah, overall, kind of a decent deck, but it's a little bit more of like a it's got a little bit more polarizing of matchups, so especially like compared to other maybe mono deck like uh, Mono Fire Rush, which is maybe a little bit more diverse in its ma matchups. I guess it's less like it's got a little bit more of a chance against everything. I think, but its matchups are a bit weaker in some areas. Um, yeah, so solid list. And then the final list is TKC's Fire Nature Light Sky Force deck. So another uh, Sky our Starlight Strategist deck. So I think this was his first preview card. So <laughs> has a soft spot in heart in his heart, and he wanted to build around it. Obviously, he's got Major Owl to pair with it, pretty nice, and uh, Voleron to pair with it as well. And I know he also mentioned that he was a big fan of like the Don Lee Wilson kind of. Uh, turbo ramp like fire nature light slim kind of control decks that uh, that Don Lee pop popularized back in the day so this is kind of a take on it that I guess foregoes uh, Andromeda and Haven which are cards that I think TKC just mentioned to me that he didn't really feel like playing with which is fair and he just wanted to go with a different kind of top end and I mean he's got a pretty good good mix of shield blasts like a bunch of high impact stuff root traps arbiters Oswin calls Kios, pretty big ramp package as well trying out the earthmon giant which is pretty strong as well and then uh i mean yeah the oswins are particularly sc particularly scary with like with the lyras and uh, starlight strategist i like how his deck's posi positioned against dragons as well just having a bunch of like mid-rangey threats like um sky crusher for example great against dragons once he's got some stuff online like the strategist gets rolling just does a great job managing birds and stuff like that like manages herald pretty well like it's just hard for it's pretty easy for this deck to go over the top of dragons with the cassiopeias like even without haven and andromeda just like ramp into these like mid-rangey threats that go just a bit over top of dragons without getting heralded is just a pretty good recipe for that matchup but uh yeah, and he's got like the shield blast that contest aggro. He's got a, a nice ramp package. The problem is like it's harder to. You're kind of really banking on Cassiopeia to kind of back up an aggressive plan against control, which seems a little bit suspicious if you're playing in that matchup. Like you're leaning pretty hard on Earthbond Giant and those ca and finding a bunch of Cassiopeias. Like one Cassiopeia might not be enough, because I mean this deck doesn't have a ton of raw card event or hand advantage and stuff like that like earthbound giant can let you save resources if your opponent helps you ramp and that can but even then you're still going to be just kind of playing one threat a turn and in the face of andromeda haven you're probably going to end up in some sticky situations where you're going to need like multiple cassiopeias to kind of push through that which i think is pretty suspect so i would imagine the control decks are kind of bad matchups because of that but Especially because you don't like hand hand discard like all that kind of stuff will be pretty effective against you as well. So yeah, it's maybe a little bit more weak to that stuff. But I mean, Major Owl and a bunch of Shield Blast it should have decent chances against aggressive decks. Although without the shield regeneration, you are leaning kind of hard on Voleron, which isn't is obviously somewhat inferior to Andromeda in that respect. So, but still, I think pretty solid deck overall. So those were the lists, and I guess we can look at the results. So Darksigner won the event. Pretty clean run, too. He just won, went 3-0, 2-0 to all of his opponents and just 
kind of easily cruise to the first place victory. Kayrick ended up finishing second, although he didn't play in the final match. He he was the only one that actually played three matches of the two ones. Um, but yeah, he had a pretty solid showing. Went uh, two one, only lost to Dark Signer in the in the second round, and then we had Andros and Gareth who have a one one record here. Unfortunately. Uh, they both got buys. Gareth a buy in round one, Andros a buy in round two, which was maybe a little bit unfortunate for how the tournament played out. As you can see, their point <laughs> differential was both minus one. I think they both took 2-0 or 0-2 losses to Dark Signer along the way. But uh, but yeah, so Gareth actually played in the finals against Dark Signer, but uh, obviously I think K Rick finished higher just because I mean he won three or two real matches, so. Unfortunate again. Louis uh, finished 1-2. I believe he lost to... Who did he lose to? Oh, yeah. He lost to... Um, do -do. He lost to Andros in the final round. And he lost to Gareth as well. So, Gareth beat him in round one. Or, Gareth beat him round two. In kind of a ridiculous match. Which I, I might get into a little bit later. But... Yeah, Louis, I think his deck overall, he ended up playing against three aggro, uh, three three of the aggro decks. He played against me, he played against Gareth, and he played against Rush. And I think looking at his deck, I think it looked like it would should be favored with that matchup lineup. But I think it, just like the inconsistencies of Fresh Ave kind of showed where, I mean, he beat me pretty convincingly, unfortunately for myself. Um, but uh, against Gareth, they played a close matchup, and I think Gareth won it in the third game. Um and then against Andros, not really sure. I didn't see those matches, so I'm not actually sure how they played out. But from what I heard, uh, Andros kind of won that one. I think it was another close match. But so yeah, interesting to see that. I guess like the the inconsistencies of inconsistencies of Fresh have kind of showed where even despite all the shield blast creatures, it's maybe not quite enough. And then myself, I finished one two. Unfortunately, I think. As I kind of just mentioned about the kind of polarizing nature of the matchups of Monolite. Unfortunately, I felt like I had three really good matchups in Dark Signers Enforcers and Andros's Rush, Garrus, Megabugs. I thought those matchups were all quite good for me. And then the matchup against Kayrick was really, really difficult. The matchup against TKC was somewhat difficult. And then the matchup against Louis was also pretty difficult. And I ended up facing against all three of the, the control decks. And I ended up going 1-2 against those, so kind of unfortunate for me in how the matches played out, but uh, yeah, I was able to defeat uh, TKC in a matchup that where things kind of just played out right for me, but, uh, but yeah, got kind of demolished in the other matches against Louis and Kayrick. And then TKC, unfortunately for him, he probably got his worst pairing round one where he played against Kayrick, who was the Haven Pile, and that ended up going to three games and unfortunately or for tkc fortunately for Carrick, it went his way and then after that him and i got pa paired in the second round and like i mentioned just previously i think things just kind of went well for me like if we look at the decks here like I, I basically dodged a lot of the shield blasts like there weren't any timely root traps and arbiters or anything like that like i remember i think game one was somewhat close where I think maybe like there was an argument for TKC to not go in super aggressively. Like I think it was actually kind of a, a game maybe I should have lost, but hard to really say. Um, I think TKC got to the point where he dropped a Volaron and went up to three shields. But I think he, rem I remember if, if I remember correctly, I think he f kind of discounted the fact that he was getting a shield at end of turn off Volaron when he was making his attack decisions. So he was worried about dying, so he decided to just um, try to go all out and kill me or break as many shields as possible to try to be able to beat a Storm Spark Blast. And ended up being a kind of close situation where I had, I think I ended up having like a Shield Blast Salvation Reckoner, but I decided not to use it because I felt like if I, if I used it, then he wasn't going to give me any more cards. But I needed to find a one drop bait so I could drop Blinder Beetle Prime the next turn. And in order to do that, I wanted him to attack an extra time. So I felt like there was a good chance if I don't use a Reckoner, then it'll attack one more time, and that could give me the bait. Um, 
maybe I don't know if that was the right play or not because it might blow the chance for me to have Storm Spark Blast, I guess. But in the moment, it felt correct, I guess. Because if I if I didn't kill him the next turn, then he was just going to get Volaron and clear my whole board. Or he was going to get to attack again with Volaron and clear my whole board even more. So I just felt like it was my time to strike. So I, yeah, I didn't use the Reckoner. Ended up finding the one drop bait and then was able to use the Blinder Beetle Prime to kill him. And I, I even then I had he had Osworn Call and Shields, but I was able to dodge it by just leaving. Uh, he didn't have the Lyra or starlight strategist all he had was a major out of drop off the osworn call but i had left my blinder beetle blinder beetle prime attack and was able to to play through that osworn major out so it kind of went perfectly for me and i kind of stole the the first game kind of um and then game two i think tkc's hand was just really atrocious like i think he osworn called down a, a war chief keo and that was like the best he could do um yeah just not a great draw for him so he ended up losing that that match and then obviously got the buy in the final round so things didn't go too well for him in the tournament like i said for myself i think my matchups were kind of bad uh unfortunately I didn't play against any of the decks that i thought i could do super well against i think if we did like a round robin i think i would have been a lot closer to the top of the standings it's easy for me to say that but i do feel confident that i almost like i would put like I mean, I don't know, maybe it's overconfident, but I would say there's like a, at least like a 70% chance I just go 3-0 against all the other aggro decks in the field. So a bit unfortunate for me there, but, um, but yeah, I felt like the match against Louis was actually on paper looking at it once again, I, I thought I was just super done for like 17 shield blast creatures. He's got the slayers. He's even like psychic predator, Rusalka serpents is just so hard if it ever lands hits board. So I thought it would be kind of. Uh, like I thought it would be kind of a, a very very difficult almost unwinnable matchup but I tested it a bit beforehand found that the matchup was actually a lot closer than I thought it was just because of the inconsistencies like it felt like it was just really low percentage that Louis actually had like the really great draw that sees like a turn three Targusher which is really annoying for me to deal with but that's like almost like the only early card in like the first three turns that he could play that matters the blockers don't really matter too much um, and then like Underworld Stalkers is pretty good four drop. Like his four drops are decent, but some of them like Taskmaster I can kind of easily answer. Psychic Predator is annoying, but can be played through. It's like tar Underworld Stalkers the most annoying. So it basically felt like if I could just if he has like one of those like really important key plays like Targusher basically, and then has like a couple blasts to back it up, then that's gonna be hard for me to win. But for the most part, like. I could beat a, beat him all just like having three shield blaze, blasts and otherwise getting completely run over. Like I could beat that, but it was like him having four shield blast creatures or like three shield blasts or two shield blasts plus like a tar gusher that was like really hard to deal with. So I felt like just, yeah, again, like the inconsistencies of his deck kind of made it or just fresh half in general, not specifically like Louis, Louis deck, not... <laughs> not throwing shade there i'm just saying like fresh have in general just has those consistency issues and I, it just despite like looking on paper seeing 17 shield blast creatures all this stuff in practice i think the matchup was a lot better but i, I mean i say a lot better but i'm talking like at first i thought it was unwinnable then i thought it was like maybe closer to clo almost close like approaching 50 50 but when we actually got into the games game one i think i probably played poorly to be honest I think I could have been a bit more aggressive, but the way the game played out, I decided to play it slower, and then I kind of got super punished him by him just kind of like finding the serpents, like kind of one turn sooner than I could have than I, than I would have liked him to. And then on top of that, we still got to a position where he needed to have like the four shield blast creature, and he ended up having it. Um, so that was kind of unfortunate for me, but I think I maybe could have played it better and just got a little more aggressive earlier on. I think I tried to manage his board a little bit too much, but it's always a tough situation because you do want to kind of clear his creatures so he can't use Cronax to deal with like my Blinder Beetle Prime. So I was, I don't know, it, it was a little bit tough to play, but, and I ended up getting punished by him finding the Serpents. And then, like I said, again, it still came down to him having that four Shield Blast creature and he ended up having it. So game one was kind of was somewhat close 
And then game two, I ended up just kind of getting crushed because my draw was just not very good. I was kind of forced into maybe a more aggressive line than I would like. And on top of that, he just had like the perfect hand of like the early Targusher plus like the two draw blocker plus the um, plus like a bunch of shield blasts to back it up. So I kind of got rolled. Um, and then, of course, my last match against Kayrick, I felt like this matchup was even harder. Like he just has a bunch of blockers, has the Slayers. Root Trap and Terra Pit, like I mentioned earlier, are just really tough Shield Blast to deal with. Absolute Darkness is just a beating as well if he gets there. Andromeda just super hard to play through. Um, Sumo Artichoke is a really insane Shield Blast against me too. So yeah, I, and Lyra as well, just a mid-range threat that just, yeah, a lot of the cards in his deck just super hard counter me. So I think game one, I actually think I threw. It was a, a kind of weird situation where... He had a Grudge Weaver out, and I had, like, oh, man, it was, I think I had, like, a, a board, and he had a set shield from Coral, and I was trying to play tricky and trying to, like, get him to, I wanted to kind of force him to block with the Grudge Weaver for whatever reason, so I, le rather than charge, like, a card from my hand, I attacked into his Grudge Weaver with that card to kind of incentivize him to block. But I don't think there was really a reason to do that because I think the the odds were that he was going to block anyways. And it was kind of dumb too because if I wanted to force out the shield that he set with Coral, then I could have just like attacked that shield earlier and it would kind of force him to block, especially because I kind of thought it was a Storm Spark Blast and it was a Storm Spark Blast. And if he wanted to protect the Storm Spark, he would have just blocked anyways with the Grudge Weaver, maybe. But then. It was a weird situation because I thought he would probably let it through so that he could just use the Storm Spark at that time to prevent further attacks. So it was this weird situation where I, maybe I outthought myself and I wanted to force him to chump with the Grudge Weaver or bait him into ch chumping with the Grudge Weaver so I could cleanly hit that shield um, when it was beneficial for me because I just wanted to get that blocker off the table because like, I think the way it played out is I attacked, he blocked, took the card from my hand, and then... The next turn, I was able to set up an attack to break the Storm Spark when it was beneficial for me, which ended up being good for me and kept me in the game and got to a spot where I could potentially win. And I think he ended up with like two Andromedas out and I was still having chances to win the game. But the problem was on like the final turn of the game, I was just like one man, one card short or one mana short from being able to kill him with a Blinder Beetle Prime. And if I had just like charge that card way back earlier in the game i would have been able to potentially win but yeah so i think i just like needlessly tried to i i like needlessly threw it because in my mind i was like i'm losing this card anyway the man is probably not going to matter so i might as well just like kind of m increase the chances that he blocks with this grudge weaver by 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 letting him discard the card from a hand and then it ended up being super relevant later because i was one mana short from being able to go for lethal um so yeah that was kind of rough um so I probably didn't play that well there were elements of that game i played well but elements that probably could have been improved and I ended up losing that close game and then the second game once again i kind of got just like destroyed by shield molass and good stuff so yeah rough tournament for me but i think things like i could like i said i could have played a couple games better um yeah probably outthought myself um so yeah from louis side of course like i mentioned he beat me somewhat handily 2-0 and then as i mentioned earlier as well he lost some andros didn't see how that match played out but kind of interesting that he lost a rush um i guess like the the fast attacks are just pretty hard to deal with restless convocation is pretty powerful like valkyrie or like yeah even I guess that's a good point too is like Gila Flame and, and, and Wildfire Valkyrie are pretty hard for him to deal with so those cards pretty strong even Torhelm if Torhelm if or if if a Louis doesn't see a Slayer then Torhelm's a huge problem as well so I, that, that's a point I could see so yeah Andros ended up taking that match and then there was a crazy match that Louis played against Gareth where Gareth just had I think game one, Louis actually maybe messed up his combo turn. Um, this match was part of why I didn't want to do coverage for the matches is because like they somehow played like an hour and a half long match. And I think game one itself was like almost an hour long. It was kind of ridiculous. I think like Gareth, I, I forget exactly because I didn't watch the whole thing, but he had like so few cards. At one point he drew like a million cards off of Cephalia. Like he had like 10 cards in hand or something crazy. But 
I think Louis maybe messed up the combo turn because there was a turn he set up the Agrix. He had ta- or not the Agrix. He set up Boran. He had Taskmaster, and I think he like started kind of comboing off, running his creatures into a tap to Anjak or something like that. Got some shields off of Serpents. Or he found Serpents, used it to get a couple more shields. But then he kind of just stopped at three shields left in play and then just passed to Gareth. And then the game went on and Gareth ended up like dealing with the Boran and was able to generate a board presence and somehow like crawl back and won the game eventually. And I think it was just a situation that that uh, perhaps Louis misplayed in the combo sequence. Like I said earlier, I'm not an expert in Fresh Av, but I felt like watching the sequence, I think there was maybe some stuff that wasn't done correctly. Like, I think at one point, Louis played Broodmother and drew two cards. It might Maybe it was better to just um, not draw the two cards, leave those in deck, and just keep going through the deck. Because I think part of what he wanted to do in that position would probably to be just to dig for an Agrix, and the Agrix would get back some creatures. And then because of that, like you could build an even bigger board. And rather than even just focusing on Serpents to get some shields, you could even just look for that Agrix, build up a board, and then actually just try to... It, there's pretty good chance you could just kill Gareth that turn with an Agrix. So I think maybe that spot was played incorrectly. I'm, I'm almost certain, but again, I'm not an expert. But I felt like that game one should have gone to Louis, but it ended up being super long and Gareth eventually kind of crawled back, was able to win it. And then game two, if I remember, Louis just kind of, yeah, just had a bunch of shield blast creatures and won the game. And then game three ended up being actually just like a kind of tempo blowout for Gareth where he just started strong, had like, um, just had the curve, drew, played his failure, drew some cards, I think, and then set up like double hive queen and just, yeah, kind of just cruised with like the normal tempo game but, but yeah just kind of an interesting match and like louis ended up playing playing a, a close one there and ended up losing so ended up finishing one two andros of course went one one i think we had to buy the second round first round he lost to dark signer where i think this was a matchup i remember after the fact i think they were talking about how it was a bad matchup for andros in my experience i felt like it was actually favored for andros but it's a kind of matchup that hinges on a few key cards. Like, Torhelm is so good against what Light Water if you see it in your opening hand. Like, it's almost a guaranteed win. Like, there's just, like, no no good answers to it. It just runs over everything. Can't be killed. Makes all the Shield Blast a joke. I think, like, Gila Flame and Wildfire Valkyrie especially, like, there's just no good answers for those. So if you get out on the front foot, like, turn one Blaze Belcher on the play especially is also almost unbeatable unless there's, like, a, tur- a first Shield Arbiter. So, like, I felt like the way things play out like it's pretty draw dependent but i felt like on average like i think mono fire is a slight favorite but in actuality the way those those two games out it was another situation where it just it didn't look close in the in the two matches i guess i think part of it was andros draw like he didn't see any blaze belchers in his opening hands he didn't see any tor helm so he missed on kind of his most important cards which made the matchup just look a lot closer than it probably, I think, is on average, I guess. But obviously you're not guaranteed to see those cards, which is why we say <laughs> your favorite on average, not every time. So, but yeah, I think game one was kind of interesting. I think the matchup could have been played a little bit better as well. I think that there, I think both games are winnable for Andros, but, um, but it was kind of close. I think game one was weird where I think Dark Signer had... Andros in pretty close to checkmate position where he could have just like broken all of Andros's shields and then his Andros's only out would be his like literal last conflagration because he'd already been through two in mana he had one left otherwise he was like just dead and even then if he did if even if he had it Dark Signer still had good chances to win outside of that um but I think Dark Signer played it safe cleared board and then Andros had the opportunity to punish by like putting Dark Signer down on shields, like forcing out a Coral set. And then as long as that set card wasn't an Arbiter, then I think, which it wasn't, then he probably could have won the following turn, assuming like the last unknown shield wasn't also a shield blast. So I think there was an opportunity for Dark Signer to play, or for Andros to play that one turn more aggressively. And then he had, I think in my mind, actually a very decent chance to win the game from that spot 
but instead I think he kind of played it, made a kind of losing play where he just kind of did a passive poke for a shield and then it basically just set up Dark Siner to win the game pretty easily from there. So I think, yeah, the, the game, that one game, I think there was kind of like a throw in, into like a reverse throw and Dark Siner ended up winning. But yeah, I, I mean, that, that, that first game should have been Dark Siner's pretty clearly. Just He was able to get out ahead, dodge the important cards, set a shield with Coral, had another shield blast as well so that one was should have been a win anyway so he got that one pretty easily and then game two was another one i felt like there were some lines that andros could have taken because he ended up and our dark center kind of took an aggressive stance started poking for shields early and andros had a bunch of options in hand and i think there were just some situations where he didn't use his mana to the full effect like he kind of wasted a mana here wasted a couple mana on another turn and I think if there were, he took some more aggressive lines, there were, were definitely options. I think it was a similar situation to the first game where he could have won, like assuming he could dodge a, a, a shield blast from a specific shield. There was definitely chances that he could have like just raced and won the game. But obviously we'll never know what the unknown shields were. But I think there were definitely chances that Andros didn't really see to to win the game. But it's kind of tough. And Dark Center ended up taking a pretty clear, clear win there, 2-0. And it made, he made it look convincing, which was pretty impressive. So that match went rough, and then obviously there was the, uh, the Louis matchup that the Andros took the win in. So ended up finishing 1-1. Gareth also, like we mentioned, had that crazy match against Louis that he won. And then in the finals, he played against Dark Siner, where, I mean, Dark Siner just also <laughs> made that one look easy, but this time it was. A little more cons- convincing where I think it's just a generally favored matchup like Blinder Beetle Prime does a great job kind of getting under the Mega Bug deck because everything like the important plays are on turn six with the exception of like maybe Anjak but even then on the draw against Blinder Beetle Prime that card's a bit slow so like Blinder Beetle Prime just does a great job if you can set that up and then on top of that just like the the what is it nine two drops I think the the nine shield blasts like the Corals, all that sort of stuff. Like it just gets you out ahead and underneath, and then you can kind of just just leverage those um, shield blast spells to to kind of to kind of win the racing situations. And then yeah, basically just take advantage of your like Garrus deck is just a bit bigger, a bit more robust to counteract like the control decks and stuff. Whereas Dark Signers is a little bit leaner, gets under them, kind of similar to how like my deck gets underneath. Uh, the aggro decks like Garrus and Dark Signers, for example, Dark Signers gets in under like the slightly bigger decks, like Garrus. So it's kind of interesting how that all plays out. <laughs> like it's basically subtracting a color each time. So you kind of end up where like Dark Signers favorite against Garrus, I'm favorite against Dark Signer, and then Garrus usually will beat like the controlly decks that I suck against, and then Dark Signers got a better chance than I do against those controlly decks, but probably a worse chance than Garrus does. So it's all about how you want to balance the matchups and in that match specifically i don't think there was really anything gareth can do um i forget all the specifics but i think dark center won the die roll and then just kind of got out ahead game one and set some shields with coral and there was like basically nothing gareth could do like he got out on an anjack was able to make some pokes and then didn't really get to get anywhere with them and then yeah dark center just took that match pretty easily uh, to win the tournament, but I guess before you get to the the, the winning the tournament part, the last matchup was against K Rick. So obviously K Rick started his round like I mentioned, beat TKC. Didn't see that matchup necessarily, but yeah, just a uh, like I mentioned, kind of way back. Like the control deck's gonna be a problem with this list, even though K Rick missing some of the key control cards. Um, still like Andromeda Haven's just a late game that's kind of hard to deal with. Especially with all these like pit root trap effects, make it hard on a deck like this that's just trying to resolve like one big creature a turn. Like those kinds of cards, especially coming out of shields, make it pretty difficult. So yeah, this deck pretty strong. Uh showing there and then also Um ended up playing round two against Dark Signer, where I think honestly Dark Signer was worried about that matchup and just like I was, and I think I don't, I don't know how convincing of a favorite, but I do think K-Rick is probably favored in that matchup. 
like just a lot of high impact shield blasts once again d absolute darkness is quite good and i mean game one just went kind of heinously bad for k-rick um i think if i remember like dark center kind of just curved out and k-rick like basically whiffed he had no shield blast just completely whiffed and also just whiffed on entirely on any kind of early plays like he might have played like one t full metal lemon on like turn four or five <laughs> that just got bounced obviously so he basically did nothing like he wasn't able to play multiple cards he just like played nothing had no shield blast and just got rolled over and died on like turn five or six um and then game two was pretty close but i think k-rick i think it basically just came down to a situation where i think he kind of misplayed the final turn where he essentially had the choice between playing andromeda and playing an absolute darkness and i think he kind of picked the wrong choice i think dark center and i talking afterwards were kind of like yeah dark Sin or absolute darkness was the, the the right play and he ended up going for andromeda but i think even then like there is an andromeda line that was defensible in that spot but i think dark Karik made the a misplay with the Andromeda line in particular because there were kind of three options at the end of the game one was just play in uh, absolute darkness and clear board one was play and Andro play Andromeda and then leave your full metal lemon untapped as a, as an untapped blocker for the following turn and then the the last option was to play Andromeda and then use your full metal lemon to clear one of dark Sinders tap creatures which was a master trader cephalia and I think between those lines like like I said I think absolute darkness was probably the best but playing andromeda and clearing the tap master trader was also like decent and not a like it, if it's worse than absolute darkness it's not a lot worse i think it yeah it was probably not the right play in the spot but it's also like it's defensible i think but the the line k-rick took was play andromeda and leave the full metal lemon untapped and not clear the master trader which i think was kind of the worst line in that situation and ended up, ended up costing him the game because he basically left himself dead to a blinder beetle prime or a piercing judgment and then dark signer drew the blinder beetle prime to kill him um so he kind of got punished for for that play i think if you absolute darkness in that spot you basically only lose to like top deck blinder beetle prime plus like a bait creature and there he only had like two baits left in dark signer only had like two baits for blinder beetle prime two two drop baits left in his deck that he could possibly draw so it was super unlikely that you died a prime and you also just cut off sasha by absolute darknessing so i don't know i think it was a situation where he kind of yeah it, it was sort of a fumble in that in that last spot like maybe he was super hard playing around regent sasha by just leaving on the the full metal lemon untapped but the problem is like if you want to play around sasha you just clear board with darkness if you're hard reading that dark signer had it which he did have it in hand but yeah, so I think that that, that turn was just misplayed because, uh, yeah, by, by leaving the full metal un, lemon untapped, you, like, it's not like a hedge where you're playing around Sasha and playing around Blinder Beetle Prime because you basically play into Blinder Beetle Prime to play around Sasha, whereas the kind of hedge play would be, would be, uh, like, if you're playing around Prime Plus Blade, then you would just play Andromeda and clear the Cephalia. So it, I don't know. I think it was kind of a came down to the final turn. I think Dark Center mentioned it was a situation where he kind of just dumped his hand, went aggressive, broke all of the rest of Karik shield, and was just crossing his fingers, hoping there was no darkness. And as it turned out, um, Karik had both darkness in hand. He just elected to play Andromeda and then kind of whiffed on the shield blast from it and lost kind of as a result. So yeah. So Dark Center was pretty happy to to escape with the victory in that match. And, uh, yeah, that kind of recaps his run where k -Rick, of course, fell in the, the second round there. And then the last round, as I kind of covered, he kind of just trounced me uh, where I think I maybe made some weird, uh, an, a, back, a mistake that backfired. Um, yeah, but I don't know. In defense of myself, I felt like that ma matchup is, like, pretty tricky to play. Like, a lot of the matchups are pretty tricky to play with Monolight. Um, whereas like from the control deck side, there's not really too much you have to do. It's kind of just play the cards and shield blast if you have them. Um, but yeah, so, so in my defense, like the, the, my side of those matchups are usually pretty tough to navigate, but, but I, I don't think I did a great job. So I lost those matches. And then, like I mentioned, dark center just had that super clean run. So, um, big congrats to him beat, uh, 
three pretty solid decks, Carrick, Gareth, and, uh, and, uh, what is it? Oh, yeah, Andros. Gareth, Gareth, Carrick, and Andros. So you beat all the guys who finished with above 50% records as well. So everyone who had a solid tournament, Andros just pretty, or Dark Signer handled pretty easily. So, yeah, once again, congrats to Dark Signer. So gets his first tournament win here with, uh, I guess avenging the, himself for the last time around where he went 0-4 with the uh, Water, Fire, Nature regeneration. So coming back pretty so pretty strong with his uh, tried and true deck. So yeah, so that was the uh, third open. One once again, the final standings are here. They are so yeah, pretty solid. Big thanks to everyone for playing once again, um, letting me share the deck list and all that stuff. So uh, that was Kaijudo Open number three. Um, so yeah, stay tuned for more events, more coverage in the future, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.